Well, welcome. Um, hello and welcome. Um, greetings from Alliance and welcome to the place to be for what's happening in philanthropy everywhere. Back in 2018, the Emirati philanthropist Bada Jaffa appealed to philanthropists to step up their act in response to rising social needs. In his forward to research on the future of philanthropy, Bada issued a call to action saying we simply must do better than the status quo. And the suffering caused by the COVID pandemic makes such agitation on his part seem prescient. The drumbeats of calls for our field to change and improve are growing louder. I'm Charles Keaton, the Executive Editor at Alliance and moderator of today's discussion. Today, we're marking the launch of new updated research on the future of global philanthropy. We'll be asking, or the research asks, questions around can philanthropy collaborate more effectively with both government and business to solve hard problems? Do we need better data and analysis and also leadership? And ultimately, can a more strategic approach to philanthropy drive large scale social change? And to explore these questions, I'm delighted to welcome philanthropists Rohini Nilakani, Lawrence Lien, Precious Maloy Modsepe, and Bada Jaffa here today. And before we hear from them, which we'll be doing in a few moments, we'll start with a brief overview of the new research to center our discussion. We'll then have a conversation with our panel before fielding questions from all of you joining around the world. And it's great that so many hundreds of you have registered for today's discussion. So please introduce yourself in the chat. I know you're not shy. It's on the right hand side of your screen. Get your questions ready and upvote others. You can take the conversation onto X, formerly known as Twitter, um, at Alliance Magazine, at, sorry, at Alliance Mag, and using the hashtag Future of Global Philanthropy. Everyone attending today is entitled to a 30% discount on any Alliance subscription, which gives you exclusive subscriber content and four issues of our flagship magazine each year. There's a link to our subscription page in the chat, and you can use the code FUTURE30 for the discount. So now over to the research. Um, I have my good colleague Zibran, I'm producing today's webinar. He's going to pull up some just very brief slides just to over, uh, provide an overview. But the series on the future of global philanthropy includes two research reports. As mentioned, they're commissioned by um, Bada Jaffa. The first was written in 2018 by the consultancy Global Agenda and was based in expert workshops or, or on the insights of expert workshops around the world. The second, um, published in 2023, published today, um, was written by Alliance Magazine's features editor, Andrew Milner, in conjunction with regional experts, S.A. Emery, Heba Abu Shneef, and Mahika Chanchani. And it was based on both desk, desk, research, desk and field research with a focus on three regions, um, Africa, Southeast Asia, and Middle East. And I'm delighted we've got philanthropists from those regions um, to provide perspectives on the research. Let's go to the next slide. So the motivation for the research is, is really, as I mentioned, but I think um, and Bada will talk a bit more about this, but the question, central question is how can we realize the full potential of a more strategically directed philanthropy to drive large scale social change? Um, we have the next slide. And just to um, focus back on what seems like an eternity ago um, in the pre-COVID era of 2018, the trends identified then were, um, as follows, globalization driving major increases in philanthropy and fast growing economies in Africa, the Middle East and Asia, and perhaps Latin America as well. And with it, economic and philanthropic power moving south and east, um, an eye watering forecast of um, a mega transfer of wealth across generations uh, estimated at 29 trillion over the next 30 years and the potential to harness faith based giving. Um, to contribute more strategically to the sustainable development goals um, and an increased availability and uh, uh, appetite for transparent data on philanthropy to inform decision making. So those were all issues identified by the earlier piece of research um, and we're just going to move um, to the next slide um, and with it some proposed actions that follow on um, from that. Um, investments in research infrastructure to improve analysis of problems and intervention points so we'll be looking and asking guests about um, what investments have been made and to what end um, since 2018. Um, more investments in the wider philanthropy ecosystem were proposed, including publications uh, like Alliance that support the philanthropy communications infrastructure. Um, and more collaboration within philanthropy and between philanthropy and government and between philanthropy and business. And underlying all of that, a question about leadership in philanthropy. Are today's philanthropists showing the leadership the times demand? Um, certainly, we have a cross-section of them here today. The question is, how representative are they of the wider 
growing ecosystem of um, philanthropists. So the report today that we're just about to discuss um, will be looking at progress on the trends, any new emerging trends, how they're playing out in specific regions and further action. And next slide, please. So some key findings, um, uh, and some of these will be more familiar than others. And I just want to actually highlight the second one that's on your screen, that philanthropy infrastructure remains stronger in countries where philanthropy is more developed. And the inverse of that is that infrastructure is weaker in those countries where philanthropy is less developed. So an important agenda for the development of philanthropy is the development of philanthropy infrastructure, one of the topics we're talking about today. Um, everyone here will be familiar with uh, technology reshaping philanthropy. We were just noting how conversations like this just wouldn't be happening. Um, we didn't have the technology in place to have people gathered from around the world um, for discussions. Um, and of course, that, that, that change is not exclusive to philanthropy by any means, but it is reshaping our field. And COVID, of course, is a presence that is a spectre, if you like, that's emerged um, uh, since the 2018 research. Um, we'll just move on to a few more findings or a few more highlights. And of course, this is in no way comprehensive, just pulling out a few points. Um, the SDGs, I want to just draw attention to them. They are proving an orienting point um, for philanthropy, but not an organizing principle. And here, uh, we've just published our new issue of Alliance, which has a special feature on progress on the SDGs, looking at the optimism with which they were um, uh, announced in 2015 and asking what's happened and where, where the potential really lies. Um, collaboration is a big theme we will be talking about. It's happening more, changing roles for business with blended um, value that I think uh, Precious will be talking about in a moment. And of course, how a new generation of wealth holders are focusing um, both on different causes and with different approaches. Um, can I just have the next slide and just a, a few more looking at countries before we turn to our, our panelists um, who are here. Um, so one informant to the research referred to growing pains for philanthropy in Africa, still affected and shaped by um, foreign funding and um, debates about how international development funding should change and needs to change, debates around decolonization, but also a need to quantify the size and impact of domestic philanthropy in Africa and provide the right infrastructure to support it. And with that, some questions were raised by informants about how money, domestic um, philanthropic money is being made and declared, um, and questions around the support for human rights and social justice causes, which can be a challenge for philanthropists who might be part of the very elites, the business, economic and political elites, but also trying to be a tugboat, maybe in some cases to those elites as well. So um, actions that were identified were funding more research, building a cadre of expert philanthropy advisors um, on the continent, investing in community led development and more building more trust and transparency in the positive potential of elite philanthropy on the continent. So just turning briefly to the Southeast Asia um, insights from the reports. We go to the next slide, please. Um, and here, I'm by no means trying to summarize what's in the report, but I did want to single out Singapore, um, where a very interesting finding was a very substantial growth in the number of family offices since 70, 2017. I think 400% growth. Um, and family offices are significant because they're a hub for managing family wealth and therefore create the conditions for philanthropy. So a question about Singapore emerging uh, having an emerging status um, at, the end, at the epicenter of Southeast Asian philanthropy. And with it, there are some action points for funders around supporting civil society and social entrepreneurs, getting younger donors engaged, bringing their expertise as well as their money to support local NGOs and local solutions to break down this huge challenge of climate change, providing local solutions to ecological challenges. Um, if we go to the next slide, and here there's just a little bit more that I wanted to draw out on the Middle East. So a few big words here around um, maybe an, a shift um, to the non-profitization and philanthropification of the public sphere in the Middle East. And by that, I think the research is suggesting that uh, with an opening of certain governments in the, the Middle East, there's a potential to expand the role that the nonprofit sector plays with both delivering public services and contributing to the public good. So in Saudi Arabia, for example, as part of its 2030 vision, a goal for 5% of the contribution to GDP to come from the nonprofit sector and with it accelerating improvements or developments in the regulatory environment. And in the Middle East, while much giving remains um, charitable in inverted commas, there's also some really 
impressive strategic innovations. One example cited is work on education across the Gulf region led by the Al Ghurir Foundation. Um, there's also a very interesting phenomenon, uh, and we covered it actually in an issue on royal philanthropy a few years ago, of a fusion of state and royal philanthropy, these semi-governmental philanthropic foundations that have an arm in government, but also have an independent status. Um, but also a note that much of the giving in the region is still steering clear of human rights causes, and uh, that might be an issue that needs further unpacking uh, uh, either in today's discussion and, and beyond. Um, but um, if we can just move to the final slide on the research, um, some actions that were identified were around funding capacity for nonprofits and civil society, bridging local communities with the wider and somewhat grander visions of the SDGs, and also building sector infrastructure to support the professionalization of the sector. If donors are going to give money to the sector, they need to know that it's professional and strategically oriented. So funding a local ecosystem, not just the global firms and consultancies in order to achieve it and advocate for a more enabling policy framework. And there's some comments um, in quite a timely way on environment, um, given Bada's role that we'll talk about um, in relation to the upcoming COP in the UAE. So those are just a kind of whistle stop tour of some of the key findings. On the next slide, you'll see a link just to our website, um, which we can go to where you will see this full report that's launching today. Um, but with that, I'm really delighted to bring in first uh, Bada, Bada Jaffa. As I say, Bada's a philanthropist we've now collaborated with at Alliance over many years. Um, he's based in the United Arab Emirates. He's a CEO of Crescent Enterprise and recently appointed special representative for business and philanthropy for the UAE COP28 presidency. But before we talk about that, I um, really just want to zero in on the research. Welcome, uh, Bada. Um, in your forward to this latest research, you say that none of the regions in the research have yet fully realized the potential for strategic philanthropy, but there is evidence that this might begin be beginning to change. So are you, can we start maybe just asking you optimistic that some of the work that you and others are doing is beginning to bear fruit, that there is a change that's underway? Over to yeah, you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Charles. So the original report uh, commissioned, as you said, in 2018, drew largely on the results of uh, a series of expert workshops uh, held around the world. Uh, and I think it yielded valuable insights into the state of philanthropy worldwide and the key trends that were shaping it. Five years on, uh, this updated report, again, as you said, uh, which I was, of course, delighted to collaborate with the uh, Alliance on, set out to achieve, I think, three main objectives. First, to sense check whether the trends identified back then were indeed playing out. Uh, second, to identify any new emerging trends. And third, uh, and perhaps most importantly, to provide practical recommendations for philanthropists on how to support and build uh, on these trends. Uh, in this updated report, and as was just shared, uh, the focus is on uh, three distinct regions, Africa, the Middle East, and uh, Southeast Asia. There are major shifts taking place in philanthropy uh, across global growth markets. As many will know, over $5 trillion of wealth in the top 30 growing economies, uh, all in growth markets, will be passed to the next generation within the next decade. And this will lead to a corresponding major increase in philanthropic activity within these societies. Now, why am I optimistic uh, to your question that these shifts are good news for the sector? Well, this next gen is reshaping the practice of giving by demanding a more hands-on approach uh, and embracing tech innovations to scale impact. Emerging digital tools and platforms are making giving much more accessible and things like big data and AI are enabling the gathering, processing, and understanding of philanthropic data much more effectively than ever before. Insights uh, from this report uh, showed that uh, technology has the potential to transform technology, I think, in three key ways. Firstly, through the growth of online giving. Second, uh, through its ability to process large amounts of data. And thirdly, by making the operation of philanthropy more transparent. I am particularly excited about this last point, uh, as I strongly believe that creating a culture of transparency 
and strong governance within the philanthropic sector is paramount for its successful evolution. Transparency builds uh, trust, uh, as we know, which is fundamental to any successful transaction. Good governance ensures that resources are used effectively uh, and that organizations are held accountable for the impact that they create. And it's for these very reasons that we launched the Governance and Philanthropy Program uh, at the Pearl Initiative, which is now in its 13th year of uh, nonprofit programmatic work around corporate governance. Now, despite these positive developments, as we also know, there is still tremendous untapped potential. The convergence of increasing wealth creation in emerging economies, the enthusiasm, uh, enthusiasm of youth, the power of technology, and the growing awareness of the catalytic effects of strategic philanthropy more generally, all underpin this unprecedented opportunity. And we must harness this potential to help uh, address the pressing global challenges that we face across uh, our social and environmental landscapes. Now, as was outlined, this report highlights that across these regions and globally, uh, two critical needs have emerged, the need for sufficient and accurate data, research and uh, analysis, and the need for greater collaboration between philanthropists in general, as well as across uh, sectors. And I hope that reports of this nature will help to create the um, impetus for these needs to be met. So thank, thank you, Bader. And you mentioned research and data to improve analysis. And one thing you've been doing, um, at least since that 2018 report, um, you've been busy trying to build um, more capacity for strategic philanthropy, primarily by establishing centres at different universities on strategic philanthropy. I think there's one in Cambridge, there's one in uh, the UAE, I think there's more that you're working on. How, how significant do you see these initiatives to building not just the knowledge ecosystem, but actually enabling philanthropy to be more strategic? The establishment of these strategic philanthropy centres uh, really is rooted in my belief in philanthropic structure or infrastructure as the backbone of strategic philanthropy. Uh, this infrastructure encompasses activating and strengthening relevant networks, streamlining conducive regulation, and enhancing philanthropic uh, governance, uh, all supported by uh, solid data and evidence. Now, we all know that regional networks for philanthropy are of paramount importance uh, because they serve to create and uh, circulate knowledge uh, bring the philanthropic ecosystem together to share experiences and inspire action and more broadly they advocate for the crucial role of philanthropy in our societies. Now as many of you know uh, only too well fuzzy legal frameworks for charity and philanthropy in many of these markets have impeded the institutionalized uh, development of foundations and the overall work of philanthropies and philanthropists Networks and institutions, I think, such as these strategic philanthropy centers, uh, uh, hopefully uh, can be an important voice in advocating for enabling regulation to help the sector realize its uh, huge uh, potential. So the motivation really to establish these strategic philanthropy centers is uh, really to create strong pillars towards building a global philanthropic infrastructure uh, enhancing the impact of philanthropic capital uh, within the regions themselves, but also as these large pools of capital are dispersed to the rest of the world. No, that, that is all very clear. And I think, you know, while many philanthropists fund research, there aren't so many philanthropists that fund research into the development of philanthropy. So I know there'll be many people here who will be uh, aware and appreciative of, of those efforts. Um, but turning to one area of one cause area where the research really does need to be harnessed um, within the SDG framework, and that is climate. So um, you've, as we mentioned, been recently appointed as the um, uh, special representative for business and philanthropy for the upcoming uh, COP. So it's a very significant moment, not just for you, but for, for the United Arab Emirates hosting this conversation about how to address the climate crisis. Are you confident that um, this more strategic approach to philanthropy that you've been advocating for can actually inform how um, climate philanthropy itself is practiced and elevate those discussions? Well, I always start with the disclaimer that I'm not an expert on philanthropy or on climate change, but I am a good student of both. And 
of course, as you've gathered, I, I believe strongly that philanthropy can catalyze the change needed to move the global system on all key challenges facing humanity and our habitats, including the climate and nature challenge. Again, I've been saying for years that philanthropy is the forgotten child of the capital system. Now we seem to have found that child all grown up. We must engage with it properly. Uh, we mustn't, uh, or we must dispel, I should say, uh, dispel this myth that philanthropic capital is too small to make a difference. Private philanthropy is at least a trillion dollars annually, probably a lot more, uh, which is again more than five times ODA or official development assistance from governments. But the real focus should be on the quality uh, of this large pool of capital. Strategic philanthropy has the ability to deploy flexible, risk tolerant, and patient capital in ways that uniquely leverage business and government capital and create that multiplier effect. And this is especially relevant to climate philanthropy, which can in many cases be, uh, or many ways, be the glue that binds business and government and civil society together in concerted action to achieve our net zero and nature positive goals. When it comes to the global south, uh, home to 80% of the world's population, these regions are going to bear the brunt, as we know, of climate change with issues like extreme heat, water scarcity, and uh, poor air quality already creating systemic challenges. And this is despite the fact that the richest 10% of the world, mostly in the global north, have per capita footprints 11 times higher than the poorest 50%. Uh, and while current levels of philanthropic funding in these markets uh, towards climate causes stand very low as a percentage of overall climate funding, probably less than 10% of the total. We have a number of major opportunities uh, on the horizon that gives me confidence that this will accelerate very quickly. The COP28, since you mentioned it, already recognizes that addressing the climate crisis is an enormous undertaking with projections of $4 trillion per year required to support our net zero and nature positive goals. No single funding source alone has the capacity to meet these needs. However, I think philanthropic capital can play a crucial role in catalyzing both public and private or business finance to unlock the trillions of dollars that are needed uh, towards both adaptation and mitigation uh, outcomes. So COP28 in the UAE will raise the bar in terms of ambition and the creation of a global architecture for all capital actors to act together at speed and at scale. And as I alluded to, the top regions to receive climate mitigation funding last year were US, Canada, and Europe, uh, according to uh, Climate Works. Africa and Latin America combined uh, uh, represented less than 10% of total foundation funding. Uh, so a key focus for COP28 will be to ensure proper engagement from these regions of the world that stand uh, to gain the most from climate action and to help funnel more funds into these regions and from within these regions. And this effort will need to be anchored in frameworks of collaboration and co-creation uh, built around uh, a common sense uh, of purpose and urgency. And just finally, as part of these efforts, we just announced, uh, in fact, uh, yesterday that we'll be hosting a first of a kind business and philanthropy climate forum on the 1st and 2nd of December at COP28 in Dubai. And this forum will gather uh, over 500 global CEOs and philanthropy leaders, placing partnership with action drivers at the core of the forum's uh, agenda. So if this is relevant to you, uh, please save the date. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that. I was just about to draw um, people's attention to it here that you're convening the Business and Philanthropy Forum over at COP, and I'm sure Alliance and others will be interested in what is coming out of that. And you mentioned partnership, and collaboration is really at the heart of um, the needs identified in today's research. And I um, thank you, Bader. We'll, we'll come back to you in a bit. I want to bring in Rahini Nilakani now. Um, welcome, uh, Rahini. Um, uh, a long-time and well-known figure in the world of, of philanthropy, chairperson of the Rahini Nilakani philanthropies, an author of multiple books, and a champion of both civil society and, um, I'd like to say from an alliance perspective, a more progressive approach to uh, philanthropy. So um, welcome, uh, Rahini. Just make sure I can see you up on the screen. 
There you are. Um, hello. Thank you. Thank hello. you for joining. Thank you so much, Charles. Thank you. And thanks to Badal for supporting the report and to all of my co panelists. So thank you, um, Rainey. And it's, um, uh, you know, one of the things the research identifies is that data on philanthropy remains patchy. And um, I just wonder what that looks like from the point of view of um, in India. I mean, what would be most helpful in terms of data for philanthropy in India and who should supply it and who, who should be paying for it? Well, I definitely think it is an important question to ask about philanthropy in India. But I have seen just in the last 10, 15 years, a steady improvement in the data on philanthropy. It is being supported by philanthropy, obviously, because that seems to be the right place to seek the support. Philanthropists themselves need to know more, as Badr was also suggesting, about the ecosystem of philanthropy in their regions and in their areas of influence. Um, some things that the Edelweiss Group has been doing together with Kurun to launch the philanthropy report every year, Bain and Dasra and others have been reporting is have been putting out an annual report. So suddenly there is much more data than there used to be. And the good news is when data comes out, even if it's patchy in the beginning, clearly the need to make it much more um, solid, much more trustworthy, much more transparent. Um, that need is growing. So I'm seeing more and more people ready in India to put out data on their own philanthropy, which is a first step. And then it's more possible to do the analytics around where it is going. Um, so I remain optimistic. I think the government can also help in this, in helping to put out um, more data uh, on helping philanthropists to put out more data on what's happening in private giving. Uh, because in India, with 1.4, almost 4 billion people, the need for private giving and collaboration with government is extremely high. So uh, I see positive trends um, in that data on philanthropy, and the funding is coming from philanthropy itself. Mm -hmm. That's good to hear. And also in relation to those positive trends, in terms of the philanthropy infrastructure that can produce this data, but also can facilitate the collaborations you're referring to. Um, how is how is the development of the, the, the infrastructure going um, in India? I mean, for example, there's the India Family Philanthropy Network at DASRA giving PI, and there's, I think, the Accelerate Indian Philanthropy Initiative that you're involved in. Are they two examples that just weren't around five years ago that reflect some of these, these changes? So there are four or five more coming up, and I think some are small, but the largest ones you have already mentioned. And I think that is um, exactly the right direction. And just to see the enthusiasm of uh, families to join the Giving Pie Network, actually it's much higher than I, I had expected. AIP is moving at a rapid clip, which is Accelerate Indian Philanthropy. Um, even we had earlier put together the India Philanthropy Alliance, which is now coming, uh, which has served its purpose to get a lot of philanthropists together, talking and sharing. Um, there are a few more, of course, there are um, uh, uh, agencies from outside like Bridgepan that have very strong India offices that are helping philanthropists. And so that philanthropy ecosystem is growing too. And, and of course, the Climate Collaborative, the India Climate Collaborative. India Climate Collaborative, collaborative which uh, I'm very proud to be a part of, um, that is really getting a lot of interest in supporting climate philanthropy in India and beyond. So, and even apart from that, the Give Collaborative, which has got a lot of philanthropists have come together, both from outside and within India, to, uh, to really build the capacity of 100 NGOs. And the second and the third uh, uh, versions of that are now being imagined. So yeah, I think philanthropy is in a very exciting space in India, much more collaboration, much more research, much more data, much more money for building out uh, civil society ecosystems for more, uh, just much deeper and much more systemic work on all the many problems we have in I mean India. And in your book, uh, Rahini, you, you know, you talk about the anchoring your philanthropy in civil society. Yes. And that isn't necessarily to the exclusion of working with government. But, you know, there are challenges in relation to the relationship between certain parts of civil society and government. So as a philanthropist, how do you how are you navigating that? 
in India. Um, so my book, Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, A Citizen First Approach, um, lays out sort of my uh, manifesto of how I work in philanthropy. I do Samaj first, which means civil society first, because I believe that when you have a very strong society, including a civil society, it is better equipped, especially with the moral readership that can be encouraged. It is better equipped to hold markets and the state accountable to the larger public interest. So I believe the more work philanthropy does on building out institutions of society and civil society, the more longer term bang you get uh, for the buck when it comes to wider public interest. So that's where I come from. But of course, you cannot achieve anything effective without working with your governments. And you have to work with your government, in, the, in our case, in a three-tiered government, local, state, and national. And um, everywhere in my philanthropy, we, after, of course, models are created, we very closely work with government wherever we can. And in my 30 years in this sector, I have not yet once found um, that government is unwilling to work with civil society organizations, the power of whose intent is very clear, who are not trying to hog all the credit, who understand how government functions and how the mandate of governments work. And um, I have had extremely positive uh, collaborations across the board in, in all the sectors that I have been involved with. And it's impossible to, as everyone knows, it's impossible to achieve the scale without working with government. There are always oh. champions everywhere. Champions and um, no doubt challenges that you're trying to overcome. But, um, oh, challenges, yes. But um, well, turning to, you know, the relationship between philanthropy and government, we can bring in now Lawrence Lien um, from Singapore. Um, he's the chair of the Lien um, Family Foundation and the co-founder of the Asia Philanthropy Circle. So a pioneer of trying to build um, philanthropy infrastructure. And I know, Lawrence, you've done work on trying to bridge and build collaboration between philanthropy and government in Singapore. Would you like to just begin by commenting on that that uh, that that point um, that Rohini was mentioning in the Indian context? How's it how's it looking in yours? It's always challenging. I mean, government is uh, always the big elephant in the room in, in, in most parts of Asia. Um, I run a circle, a network of philanthropists around the region called the Asia Philanthropy Circle. Um, and I can, and, and I would say the membership is split, you know, I've got half members who say, you know, stay away from government as much as possible because, you know, they're always bad news, you know, when they get meddled in, in your in your work, uh, you produce even uh, uh, well suboptimal outcomes because you you have to listen to to the way they, they want things to be done. And another group said we've got no choice, but we, we have to, to to work with government. I would say in Singapore, um, because we have a very strong state, um, uh, working collaboratively with government is still not a very common thing. I mean, it's, uh, the government perspective of civil society is that you are our hands and legs, you know, you don't, we do the thinking for you. Uh, and of course, in, uh, in a place like Singapore, you know, people have a lot of trust, you know, uh, uh, in, in government and essentially um, government crowds out private initiative, which um, I mean, I, 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 tr I truly believe, you know, aligned with uh, Rohini that in the, in the principle of subsidiarity that you know, decisions must be pushed to the lowest as close to the citizen as possible and and even if the state is more efficient you know you need to build the power of agency in people so that there's a sense of ownership in the work and and this is even more critical because the problems that we face are more complex uh and and and, and the government cannot do it, uh, everything including the singapore government when i've seen uh, i guess the, the uh, work the collaboration is more um the philanthropists and foundations being the innovator of you know, being the innovation capital, being the risk capital, because even in uh, in Singapore, the government is uh, is not entrepreneurial. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, the, the Liam Foundation, my family's foundation, that's that's what we do. We focus on new models, on things that are uh, yeah. uh, under the radar, you know, unloved uh, projects, yeah. you know, um, and, and we fund them and, and we show that it works. And then that's when the government may come in to, to take over. Well, and just, just uh, building on that, I mean, the trend we identified earlier in relation to Singapore was this, I think, 400% explosion in the growth of family offices. And that, you know, family <laughs> offices can bring 
that entrepreneurial drive, that innovation, that experimentation. So do you see, you know, yes, government may to an extent crowd out that private initiative, but do you actually see the kind of resurgence of private initiative alongside government? I mean, what does that, that statistic mean in practice in terms of uh, family office and philanthropy in Singapore? Well, uh, Charles, you know, potential doesn't mean that it happens, right, you know. Um, and there is a, a very, uh, I mean, you, you talked about the explosion of family offices. I think S Singapore is poised to be a philanthropy hub. We are the wealth management hub of, of Southeast Asia, if not the, the, the wider Asia. But I think um, too much philanthropy is too slow and too safe. Um, the next generation, Bada talks about the next generation wanting to get going. The patriarchs are not letting them, and the patriarchs are doing things, you know, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to paint all patriarchs, patriarchs and matriarchs the same, but there's a tendency of first generation wealth creators, uh, I, I think the people on this call are accepted, uh, to, to, to fund charitable charity that is really downstream, you know, and, um, and while, so the next gen will be old gen by the time they, they are given the reins, you know, and, and they won't have the energy to do the work that they, <laughs> they're, they're trying to do. Uh, so, Potential doesn't mean that things are, are being carried out. Today, uh, I'm very happy to announce that we launched the Asia Community Foundation. So as if I, I haven't launched enough things, I launched another platform. Uh, and the reason is this, you know, the, the uh, Asia Philanthropy Circle is, only, is always a small circle for, uh, I, I guess, experienced philanthropists trying to, to, to grow the, the philanthropy and we were, we were very frustrated that they were not doing it at scale and strategically, you know, what, what, what Bada says. But I, I want, what I'm seeing is that a lot of money is, is left on the table. People are not even giving, not because they don't want to, because it's just because the philanthropy marketplace is so inefficient. It's so difficult for people to find the right opportunities, uh, the, the right organizations to fund. So we want to, to stream like that. We want to make it more efficient to be the clearinghouse, you know, to be the central point to facilitate the exchange between givers and nonprofits, um, streamline and standardize uh, uh, you know, the, the giving uh, ecosystem, you know, whether it's due diligence, grant agreements, reporting. Um, and over time, you know, set these as the, I mean, the, the longer term goal is that maybe by doing this privately, you know, we can work with governments to set the standards for the region. Uh, yeah, and uh, it really sense your frustration that things can be and should be better. I mean, in your own research at the Asian Philanthropy Circle on the future scenarios of Asian philanthropy, you said that there's a heritage of Asian philanthropy that is long on generosity across generations, while short on positive social impact. And you really want, you call on the Asian philanthropy to disrupt itself. Um, and, you know, it is interesting. You're launching the Asia Community Foundation next week. Um, the Temasek launched Trust. Today. Um, we launched it today. <laughs> it launched today in the Temas and the Temasek um, uh, um, Foundation with the, the Philanthropy Asia Alliance. So are you optimistic that there is disruption that is happening? Well, I'm, I'm optimistic that, uh, you know, there are enough people now talking about saying this, the right things and having the intent to disrupt. It is not yet happening, you know, I, you know, giving, Asians are, are very generous people. If you look at the World Giving Index, which is not about strategic philanthropy, obviously, there are many Asian countries at the top, but it's all mostly about charity and helping people get by, which is fine, but this is, this is only, this doesn't solve the long-term problems, as we know. It, it doesn't tackle problems at root, doesn't uh, address structural problems. And what we do need, you know, um, is, is, is to be, is to disrupt the system, you know, and, and create and, and look. And it's, and so our future of Asian philanthropy uh, exercise was aimed at doing that. You know, yes, that is scenarios, the creative stories that enhance our capacity to perceive and welcome change. But we have a set of recommendations, you know, to uh, that really you know, uh, encourage philanthropists to drive change at the systems level and to, to working with governments, you know, innovation, collaboration. Well, we'll we'll certainly be, keep keep our eyes on it. Um, but let's now move from Singapore to South Africa. Uh, before we do, just a note that after hear from Precious, we'll be taking questions from all of you. We're running until three fifteen UK time today, so we should have a good amount of time for uh, questions of all of you. Um, and please put them in Slido, um, which is a tab at the bottom of your 
screen and we'll try to get to as many of them. But now, um, last but not least, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome Dr. Precious Malloy uh, Motsepe. I'm the co-founder and CEO of the Motsepe Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic foundations or organizations in Africa, and the founder of Africa Fashion International and currently Chancellor um, of the University of Cape Town. So uh, delighted to welcome you, uh, Dr. Precious. Hello there. Check you can uh, see and hear me okay. Yeah, we can see you there. No. Um, so just to, to kick off, really, um, it's, it's that, you know, you've been listening into this conversation about developments in philanthropy and philanthropy infrastructure. Um, is there a unique flavor to African philanthropy that distinguishes itself? And there was a word of warning from uh, Dr. Precious that there were maybe going to be some technical challenges due to load shifts in South Africa. Um, so if we can't bring her in for any reason, um, we'll try one more time. Otherwise, we'll go to questions and then come back to Dr. Precious. But uh, Precious, can you hear me now? I um, just need to put mute off. I can hear you now, but I, I missed a lot so, of what you, you asked. Um, could you just... Uh, well, I, I just introduced you uh, and also just asked how, whether you think there's a distinctive flavor to the African philanthropy conversation. Okay. okay. Well, thank you very much. And congratulations uh, to Bada for this uh, wonderful research that you're launching today. I think it's, it's really fantastic and uh, it's very much needed. Um, from Africa, and I really like what um, um, our, our colleague said about uh, Asian giving, uh, philanthropy in Asia. That's very much the story of African philanthropy. Um, we base our giving, whether it's charitable giving, and it doesn't matter how much you're giving, on the concept of Ubuntu. And that means that... Um, my success is so intricately in, intertwined with your success. We depend on each other. Uh, so giving on the African continent and irrespective, irrespective of the quantum is driven by this philosophy of Ubuntu. Um, so just to get back to, um, you know, uh, how we are giving uh, within the foundation, we... Um, started off with uh, charitable giving and we transitioned to strategic philanthropy when we joined the giving pledge and that's when we um, committed a significant funding towards causes that we had identified as important and um, uh, that are aligned with our mission and our mission is really alleviation of poverty on the continent contributing to us alleviation of poverty on, 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 the, on the continent. And I really like the way that uh, Zafra, uh, the, 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 I mean, the research uh, speaks about um, the, the, the newer ways of doing philanthropy. We have uh, been around for quite a number of years. We've tested a um, few ways of giving. We have failed in a lot of them, but in failing, we also learned how not to do it. Um, for instance, we have identified regions that, um, you know, the, the, the poorest in South Africa. And by the way, although the, the foundation is located in South Africa, we work um, in South Africa on the African continent and we work globally with partnerships. And I'll speak briefly to the partnerships that we work with. So um, we, we started off with... Uh, partnering with communities. So when, when, when my colleagues talk about collaboration, that was a very important collaboration for us, community-driven philanthropy. And that meant we went to communities themselves to find out what their actual needs are. Um, and then we responded in partnership with the communities, having appointed community leaders in various areas, and we worked very closely with them. The other important, um, you know, tool that we used, you know, um, I, I cannot agree more with, um, you know, the, the, the fact that government is such an important stakeholder, and we find that we 
we have partnership with governments in most of the areas that uh, we work in because government has the biggest resource more than most of us as you know philanthropists could ever have for instance we work with um schools throughout South Africa. Um, we, 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 we drive education, we do infrastructure in schools, uh, primary schools, we fund education in tertiaries, uh, you know, tertiary education, but we could not get into um, uh, uh, schools if it was, if we did not have the infrastructure that the government has created. All the children that we want to assist are in schools and that's the best place to find them. So the partnership with government for us has been you know, very, very significant. It's not easy, it's challenging, but it's about the other you know, work of building relationships um, uh, together with governments. Um, our focus areas, women and youth, youth particularly, you know, 60% of our population is under 25, uh, important areas that we focus on is education and skills development, particularly digital, digital skills. We want to take this youth population with us uh, to the future of work. Um, um, if I could we, just um, come, come in here just on, on that question of philanthropy and, and government, Dr. Precious. So um, I think you made a very powerful case for why there's a need to work with government. But can we also just be interested in your views on the flip side of that, and that's philanthropy working with business. Because I know that you're an advocate, yes. advocate of blended value, um, where businesses all right. also can contribute to social good as well as pursuing profit. Do you see that as just two sides of the same coin? Is that what you're doing there, given you know your resources come from a family-owned business? Absolutely, and that's where I was, I, I was uh, leading into. Yes, we started uh, with our family businesses, corporate social responsibility, which is important. But when we moved to create our own philanthropic organiza you know, organization and with funding, then we started um, you know, collaborations with, and I'll give you examples. We have a collaboration with um, uh, other philanthropists, uh, you know, big business uh, leaders in looking at breakthrough energy ventures, where we fund um, innovative solutions towards uh, challenges of energy on the continent and globally, um, and a lot of this comes into the continent. The other area that we're working very closely with partners, uh, you know, in business is around the issue of social entrepreneurship as well. Um, on the continent, social entrepreneurship is critically, critically important because it uses business principles um, but has a very strong social motive. So um, on the continent, the, you know, the, the, the issue of social entrepreneurship, impact investing, for instance, that has become critically, critically important. Um, we, you know, uh, private funders are more and more looking at, uh, we have people who look at how do we improve um, you know, the, the, the position or situation of women, empower women on the continent. How do we help with climate change? Uh, you, you correctly pointed out, I think, Zap, uh, Zap, uh, you, you know, you mentioned the, the issue of climate change. And with climate change, we're not only looking at private sector, but also at government. You've seen how African leaders have been very vocal about how we use taxes globally and the, the, the climate crisis that we are seeing on the continent. Um, and I think lastly, I want to mention an innovation around philanthropy that we have also a, a, you know, a partnership um, with private sector on, and this is on prizes. So we give, we have a multi-million, multi-year prize initiative where uh, innovators, entrepreneurs, um, can come up with solutions that address critical problems on the African continent. We did the first one around agriculture, and now we're working on another one on energy. Thank, thank you. And um, we will be interested to follow um, their development, see the, and cover the awardees, which I know is going to be an important focal point for all those prizes. But thank you for your, your contribution there, Precious. We'll come back to you shortly. But I do want to move to Slido, encourage everyone who's listening in to post questions and start with a, um, a, a challenging one, actually, that's been sent over by Helen Campbell Pickford, but um, seems to be quite popular. Um, and that is, 
um, to really ask you, or maybe we'll start with you, Bada. Um, interventions funded by philanthropists often influence public policy or are designed to influence public policy. Um, do you see this influence as legitimate and what checks and balances are needed to make sure the influence of the, the, the super wealthy is for the public good? So um, maybe just um, put that question to you first, but then be welcome perspectives from, from the other panelists too. I would say that advocacy is a very important tool that philanthropists can use to help shift uh, the system. Um, of course, as I mentioned in my remarks, for me, governance structures are what's required to underpin uh, both the quantum and also the quality of, of effective strategic philanthropy. And I believe if, you, if we do have these governance structures in, uh, in place, and that would avoid some of the potential, um, you know, uh, uh, harmful effects of the flow of these large pools of capital. Uh, so I think it's tied to what I said. If we have good governance in place, just like in the for-profit arena, if we have good, strong governance in place and uh, entities really understand the business case, if you will, behind those good, good governance structures, then we'll see uh, less and less of the potential uh, and in some cases, even unintentional uh, destructive uh, causes of the flow of these large pools of capital. Thank, thanks, Bada. Rohini. Yeah, uh, well, I think it's a fair question to ask about the power of money. And that, to me, it's very important to keep that question on the table at all times. Having said that, private philanthropy, I think is very important to, uh, you know, to to provide the risk capital that the state or the market cannot invest in for social innovation. So, but I would say this, that of course there has to be the media or research organizations or organizations like Alliance that are also keeping an eye on the power of money, which you do it admirably, because of course there is going to be that question. To me, it is about the power of intent behind that philanthropy, but I think also the grammar of that intent. Is that philanthropic capital only coming just because one philanthropist believes in something or is the the program designed through co-creation with other civil society organizations academic institutions is there enough feedback is the goal of that philanthropy at a systemic level going to distribute agency or narrow it is it going to be about diversity and about creating not uniform, uh, maybe a unified response to complex solutions, but certainly not a uniform one, and so on and so forth. Is it going to be technology led or technology enabled? I think you can see that when private capital is being used for large systemic change. And for me, the most important test, smell test, if you will, is, is the big private philanthropy distributing the ability to solve or is it pushing some pet solution down the line? And I think there should be enough eyes on this. But I do believe in the power of intent of private philanthropy. But I also believe there must be counterbalances and checks to keep an eye on it, which is where, to Bader's point, that's why we need much, much more transparent data on philanthropy and where money is going and what is it achieving. Mm -hmm. and, just to, and just to... Just to come in on, on that, Rohini, before we go to, to Lawrence, um, who's inspiring you in terms of actually distributing that power in the way you describe, as opposed to, let's say, concentrating it or doing it in a more arbitrary way, which is a, some people may be inspired by your, your approach to philanthropy and some of the others here, but who's actually, do you think, doing it really well? So, um... I mean, this sounds a bit self-serving, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the, working uh, with my husband on large systemic issues in my country, which is where most of my philanthropy is focused, I realized, though I'm not a techie, I realized how you could use technology um, to really be able to allow everybody to play a small role. And just, I'll give you only one example, except work with and for the union government of India to design the national teacher platform called Diksha, which has now grown into billions of transactions on the digital platform. But we realized that if you designed for scale of participation, uh, then 
every teacher, many parents, many, many millions of students could be able to shape how that platform works. So we learned it partly from our work, but of course there are many others around the world who have been doing, and many large international institutions that have worked on, I mean, we saw a lot in the pandemic, but even before that um, in, in say polio or many, it needed many moving parts to be able to be held to work together in their local context to create a large system change in whatever thing we were trying to solve. So the polio thing did has is one of the case studies that I think about when it comes to success of uh, distributing the ability to solve in context. Thank you. Lawrence, uh, who, who's inspiring you? Who's distributing philanthropic power to solve problems well? Um, or add anything else in response to that question before we move on to, to some others? Well, I, I take a lot of inspiration for my fellow uh, Asia Philanthropy Circle members. And, and um, when we talk about influencing public policy, I think that the process of doing it matters, right? Uh, I think I, I, I agree with a lot of uh, what Rohini said. Uh, if it's just your own private, in if you're just driving your own private interest and, and doing it narrowly, you know, that's the wrong way to go. You want to know or know what you want to have open conversations and I just remember uh, a dinner that we just 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 to give you an example right you know we we held a dinner with business leaders and government people senators uh, in in the Philippines uh, to talk about early child development because there there seemed to be a, a sense of wanting to do more among uh, in government. Um, and nine months later, you know, just uh, just two months ago. Um, uh, our member who was leading that conversation was invited to the Senate you know, for a hearing. Um, and two senators had introduced new bills to improve early childhood development. It came, the starting point was that dinner conversation that uh, uh, my circle uh, convened. Um, and uh, so, so and, and we had presented the, the issues you know, to, to the senator. Um, so when something is, uh, I mean, you want to, cr to to make sure that many people are on board because you, you, uh, our role is quite often to put the spotlight on issues, to show uh, contradictions, you know, that we, we have these values, we have these priorities, but we are not living up to them, you know, um, and, 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 and our policies do not reflect, you know, the way that we, we, we have our aspirations. Uh, those sort of conversations should be quite easy to have when you talk about policy change. I think where it gets a lot more hairy and, and tricky is when you are trying to change values uh, and, and priorities of, of the government and of the people. Sometimes that is absolutely legitimate because uh, people, masses of people can be wrong, but sometimes we can be absolutely wrong ourselves. So that that would be, I'll, I'll pause on that a little bit, you know, when that well, um, I'm glad you raised that. The next um, special feature of Alliance is looking at the intersection of philanthropy and politics um, and the interventions that philanthropists make across the political spectrum on that um, for better or worse, depending maybe on your point of view. So um, that is to come on the pages of Alliance. Well, I'd like to bring in Dr. Precious um, now. This is a question from Mary Beth. Um, could you talk a bit more about social cohesion as a philanthropic objective? This seems to be a global, national and local need as hyper-individualism grows across cultures. So is there something about philanthropy's contribution to the common good um, that you see in your, your work, that, that wider sense, in, in its widest possible sense? Sure, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all know the history of South Africa, um, you know, that we come from an apartheid era, so there's always been segregation uh, according to race, um, you know, uh, uh, religion, gender, it's, it's just been our history. Um, and um, firstly, I'll just go back in history. We've seen uh, what, um, uh, you know, people like Gandhi have done for South Africa, Mandela have done for South Africa, other philanthropic organizations in the West, what they have done to change the policies in South Africa. This was not really out of self-interest. It was really focused on uh, applying pressure and changing our policies. Um, um, I, I guess that speaks also to the, the power of money and um, influence on policies. But at a personal level, 
what we do um, as a foundation, we work uh, with schools and uh, these schools have always been segregated. You had white schools and uh, schools for, for poorer black students. And, and we have co competitions in, in sports um, like netball. And I can tell you, it is the most beautiful thing to watch as you see these 12 year olds playing sports together um, they disregard race. They don't even, you know, it's, 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 it, they are so close and they work together towards the same goal. So one area we found very, very significant in social cohesion has been around sports. The other area is um, through religion. We work with all denominations, religious, religious organizations, faith-based organizations in South Africa. Um, and uh, we, we, we oft, every year we have what we call the National Day of Prayer, and we convene at a uh, stadium here that um, houses about 95,000 people, and it's full to capacity, and people are even outside the stadium. And we have prayers from, uh, you know, uh, from, from the Jewish faith to the Christian faith to, to the Muslim faith, all these Christian leaders come up and they pray and everybody is just united. It is also, again, a beautiful form of using religion for social cohesion. Mm. That's a, yeah, that, well, that's a very poignant example. Um, so often some of the debates around faith-based giving are making it more strategic, but actually thinking about the unifying role that it can play in, in transcending some of the divides. That's a very powerful example. I um, want to move to back to the climate conversation. We have a question from an interesting question from Matey Ab Abaretz, and apologies if I've pronounced your name wrong. And you've said, how could the oil and gas sector work with strategic philanthropy on the climate challenge? And, and that's actually an interesting pertinent question for you, Bada, because your, some of your family wealth comes from the, the oil and gas sector. And now you have this particular role at COP to address climate change. So presumably your answer would be, it can. Um, so the question is, what are the best ways to do so? How do you see kind of oil and gas um, connecting to uh, climate philanthropy, the climate philanthropy questions? You're still muted, Bada. Apologies. No, so it can and it must, uh, Charles. Um, and one of the key differentiators behind the COP28 process is that it's an inclusive process geographically, sectorially involving all stakeholders and all partners. Now, I think we've been talking a lot on this uh, discussion or in this discussion so far on individual philanthropy, but I think corporate philanthropy has an important role to play. And I do think that um, as Again, the infrastructure for philanthropy improves in many of these um, global growth markets, including in the Middle East and North Africa, uh, and of course, other parts of the world. It will also help to enhance how businesses give. Now, I'm not talking about, I'm a huge proponent of how businesses need to fundamentally adapt their business models uh, to align with societal and environmental needs. But I do also think that businesses can be philanthropic actors and actually have part of their retain, retained earnings uh, um, invested, if you will, through philanthropic intervention. Uh, and I don't like that, you know, some would refer to that as CSR, but I think it can be far more strategic than so-called traditional CSR. So all sectors have a role to play. And in particular, uh, when it comes to, of course, climate uh, and nature protection, um, the oil and gas sector obviously needs to play a, a very important role in that as well. And I and I am, am hopeful that we will see um, some important announcements uh, in the upcoming COP and, of course, uh, in the months and years to come uh, around that very point. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to come on to a question about intermediaries. Um, uh, uh, I'm just trying to locate it because my screen is constantly moving. But um, there's a question about the role um, of intermediaries and as regranters. Um, I'm just trying to find it, bear with me. Yes, um, it's from um, Andrea Roderick's. Global philanthropies have attempted to achieve scale and reach by granting through intermediaries. Given the complexities of issues and importance of collaboration, do you anticipate a trend for global philanthropy to shift to granting through platforms and alliances rather than through individuals and projects? Um, which of you would like to address that point? Just jump. 
I, I could make a very small point that, uh, for example, our participation and co-impact, for example, uh, suggests to me that uh, philanthropists are beginning to see merit. There are at least five great such platforms for collaborative international giving. And I'm seeing more philanthropists interested uh, to know how to, how to um, uh, give through those platforms because one is there are many, many advantages to doing so. And possibly that's easier than giving directly or to smaller organizations. So I'm very hopeful about global collaboratives such as Co-Impact, Blue Meridian, et cetera, et cetera. Lord, of course, yeah, of course, uh, what I've been, what I'm launching the Asia Community Foundation is uh, an intermediary and uh, I think the benefits for, for donors is that uh, you get to assess uh, smaller local community based organizations that are often not on the radar. Um, we also save the, the, the nonprofits, uh, particularly these small ones, a lot of work by aggregating funding so that they are not doing uh, due diligence 10 times for 10 different funders and, 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 and 10 different grant agreements and 10 different reporting uh, templates and cycles. Uh, so, so I think it bo on both sides, both donors and, and uh, recipients will win. Well, and just sticking with you, Lawrence, there's a related comment and question from Neelam here, which says CSOs working directly with communities um, and rural, rural areas are often left out of the attention of major philanthropy. But these are the ones who have decoded complex solutions that work with the ultra unprivileged. How do we make philanthropy more hyper local and accessible to these folks? Um, uh, and maybe that also relates to that question, that, or that comment that Rohini was making about distributing power. So, um, Lawrence, um, maybe just yeah, build build on build on that question. Um, if you yes, can. I mean, so so that's part of finding you know these opportunities for for uh, donors. Uh, Based in Singapore, or even outside Singapore, um, but uh, we also need to work with partners on the ground because we won't, we ourselves will not be able to assess you know, some of these uh, these opportunities. Uh, so if there are partners on the ground, I think that what is frustrating is that, that quite often, even to, uh, I mean, when we look at countries around us, uh, these organisations are not even funded by philanthropists within their own country because. Uh, uh, local philanthropists uh, run operating foundations because of the, such a high level of distrust. So I think we do need to to get uh, more founded local people giving locally, um, and uh, and 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 building all, all these uh, more community based intermediaries on the ground to find these opportunities, but also to build capacity in some of these organisations to so that they can receive more more grants. <laughs> Thank you. I can see Rohini nodding there. Do you want to just uh, briefly comment on that? It's a very quick thing. This is a good question. There are in India, there are thousands of small NGOs doing very relevant local work who cannot get access to capital. So some of the work that we are helping is uh, to get them to tell their story better. To today, you have and, and this is the point of your report, right? How do you use technology to enhance? the ability both of civil society organizations and philanthropists to be more effective. So some of the things is they need help. They also need shared services, financial services, legal services, compliance services. Otherwise, they're simply not able to raise their head above water. So I think philanthropy needs to focus on, on creating that sort, of, um, that sort of help for small organizations who do, do such powerfully important local work and in the context of climate and disa disaster but i hope there won't be any but there will be uh, to help them to do a rapid response so to create those trust networks on the ground i think philanthropy needs to step up to make that happen um, Bata, you want to come in here please go ahead just to uh, highlight i think the crucial role that media plays and needs to play in helping to build this, this trust that, that we've just uh, been hearing about. I think uh, particularly in many of these markets uh, that this report um, discusses, uh, media or philanthropy media is still at uh, a very nascent uh, stage. Mm -hmm. And so it, it can and really should, and I hope will um, help to play a more significant role in helping to showcase these champions that Rohini was just talking about. 
um, and really uh, highlighting uh, best practices, examples, but also what hasn't worked. Uh, and I think when media and, and uh, you know, journalism works well, um, it's able to move, move the needle in the right direction. Uh, and as you know, this underpins some of the work that uh, we're doing, Charles, um, helping, to, helping to encourage more uh, philanthropy journalists in these markets to go out there and to build these stories and to disseminate these, this knowledge and information uh, in a more in a real time way. Yeah, no, I agree with you there. You know, journalism can really tell the story of philanthropy, but also be a critical friend um, to the field, and that that's certainly what we and others are trying to do. Fred Precious, let me bring you in. I have have a specific yeah. question yeah. for you, but come can in on I this just, one. First. Yes, yes, I wanted to say that uh, you know, coming from a corporate sector. We know that most of the projects that you do, you fund the marketing thereof. This is no different in philanthropy. We found that where the work that we do, we have to allocate a small budget to ensure that um, we can get word out there. We can, you know, engage people. Uh, otherwise, um, the education that you talk about does not necessarily happen and journalists will not come to cover the work if uh, you haven't actively without you know i know marketing is an ugly word but there needs to be a way of communicating about the work um, and, uh, and 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 engaging and educating the public government and civil society as well uh, and we'd love to talk more about philanthropy and its relationship with journalism um but there's a question here from ben reimer who's coming back to the question you were talking a lot about dr precious which is um, that we know that many governments have little or limited capacity focused on philanthropy. So what are your suggestions of places to start to build government's capacity to engage with, with philanthropy? And uh, we've only got time just for some final closing reflections um, um, from you, Precious, and then I'll uh, have, have to wrap up, I'm afraid. So go, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, Charles, is that for me? Yes, a question for you, government, how to engage, build government capacity to engage with philanthropy. Oh, okay. So, so what we, we found what works is to, um, as I said, build relationships with, with uh, specific government departments, particularly in the areas of philanthropy that we work with in. We work with the ministry, with, in education, Minister of Education, in sports, uh, the same way. In certain instances, we found that allocating resources to help those departments uh, in order to help the work that we are trying to do has also been uh, quite helpful. Um, we have published work, for instance, we've worked with, um, uh, we, we published gender, gender responsive budgeting initiative, which looks at government departments, their policies, and how they allocate funds towards the project that they want to do. And then we, 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 we show government that this is the way to do things and, um, and then work with them to, in, to ensure that they can then roll that out. Um, so, so there's uh, various ways that uh, we, we think working with government. Uh, first, proof, you know, showing them the proof that um, this is what needs to happen. Maybe helping with resourcing, uh, you know, insourcing and um, ensuring that they have the capacity, somebody who can teach various government departments um, uh, about the work that you're trying to achieve. And then of course, um, just building those relationships and inviting them uh, into our organizations, being transparent, being open about what we do. Um, and and mm -hmm. so, so we have that relationship. Right. Thank you. That's a fascinating note, note to end the conversation on. Um, finally, there is one question that's been very popular, and that is maybe a question for Bader and uh, myself to reflect on. And that is why this report uh, doesn't include um, the coverage of Latin America. And what does that mean for the Latin American philanthropists? And maybe, uh, you know, that is a good question. It's a fair, fair comment. And, you know, I think this is a series. So there may be that um, and we can bring Latin America much more squarely into the conversation. It's certainly something we're very mindful of. I'm here at Alliance, and I'm sure you are uh, too um, on the on the panel. Um, but that's all we have time for. The 75 minutes has really raced by. I'd like to thank everyone that's joined. We hope you enjoyed the discussion. And if you found it helpful and engaging, don't forget to subscribe to Alliance with the discount code FUTURE30. And don't worry if you missed the offer during our event today. We'll be sending out emails to you shortly with the discount to get you started and a recording 
of the event to everyone who registered. But I'd like to just end by saying a big thank you to um, our panelists, um, Bada Jaffa, Rahini Nilakani, uh, Dr. Precious Maloy Mosepi, and Lawrence Lien um, for your contributions today. Um, and also a special thank you to Bada Jaffa and Nita Manik and his office um, for all your partnership, not just on this report, but also our work with our regional representatives um, that are working around the world to increase our networks, insights, and sources um, uh, to tell a truly global story of what's happening in philanthropy, or at least aspire to. Um, thanks. I'm in the background um, to Amy McGoldrick and Zibran Chowdhury for both producing and covering today's event and ensuring everything runs um, smoothly. And thanks to all of you for being part of Alliance's community of crit critical friends and practitioners. Our next webinar looks at philanthropy's contribution to the Sustainable Development Goals, um, the centerpiece of our new issue. And that webinar is on the 19th of September. So do sign up um, today. You can sign up on the events page of our website. As I say, we're striving to make Alliance the place to be for what's happening in philanthropy everywhere. And it's really great to have you on that journey with us. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. Bye for now. Thanks, Charles, for your great moderation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Namaste, everyone. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>